This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Yort. It's Friday, April 9th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. Prince Philip, the Greek-born consort to Queen Elizabeth Britain's longest sitting monarch has died at the age of 99. The Duke of Edinburgh is best remembered for his sense of duty to the Queen and also his sense of humor. Henry Rijo reports from London. He was a man of the times, the rock behind one of the most extraordinary monarchs Britain has ever had. Philip Mountbatten met Elizabeth while he was a naval cadet. She was a shy princess. They married in 1947. When she became queen, he found it very difficult to give up his naval career, says Philip Ede, author of the book Young Prince Philip. He'd been an extremely successful, um, extremely highly regarded naval officer in, in, in the British Navy. And he was tipped for the very top. He was tipped to be, you know, become head of the Navy. And so to have to give that all up in order to become the sort of second fiddle to his wife, you know, he was a very overtly masculine character and not one who's going to take easily to this sort of life of, of walking a couple of paces behind the Queen. When asked in an interview what he thought of his role, Prince Philip replied, I don't. He grew up with a very strong sense of duty and he realised that this, his duty was first and foremost to, to support the Queen in, in, in her work. And that was really by far and away his most important. How he saw his role, that was really at the top of the list. Over seven decades, Prince Philip navigated the highs and lows of a royal family permanently in the public eye, including the death of Princess Diana in 1997. Take care of the boys. Take care of the boys, Mum. That's what we've been doing. Sorry? That's what we've been doing. How you did. Prince Philip was known for his wry sense of humour. I've seen the world's most experienced pluck on there. <laughs> which came in handy whenever he had to brush aside any suggestion of his role as a secondary figure. He once said his best speech was in 1956 when he opened the Summer Olympics with eight words, I declare open the Olympic Games of Melbourne. His jokes on occasion caused offence, but he had a serious and lasting effect on the monarchy, pushing it to change with the times. That's something Philip has always saw for himself, is this idea that the monarchy must evolve. For example, he was very pro having the cameras in for the, uh, Elizabeth II's coronation in 1953. You know, he was one, you'd think because of his overall reputation, he'd be one of the people who was quite conservative. But actually, no, he saw television as the future. People want to see more of their monarchy. Prince Philip retired from official royal duties in 2017. A year later, he was involved in a serious car accident while driving near the royal family's country estate at Sandringham. His last public appearance was in July 2020 at Windsor Castle. Fulfilling his roles as consort and father, Prince Philip's effect on a 1,200-year-old institution is a monarchy more visible and relevant to its people, a legacy he forged from his place two steps behind. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Regional leaders from countries including South Africa, Zimbabwe and Botswana met in Mozambique's capital Maputo Thursday to consider a response to the insurgency in the Southern African nation. The leaders agreed on a technical deployment to Mozambique and said further meetings of regional bloc SADC would be convened. Meanwhile, a police commander in the Mozambican town of Palma says 12 people presumed to be foreigners have been found dead at a hotel following an Islamic State claimed attack. David Doyle of Reuters has more. Twelve people believed to be foreigners have been found beheaded in the Mozambican town of Palma, following an Islamic State claimed attack. That's according to local police commander Pedro da Silva, in footage aired by Mozambican channel TVM. He said he believed they were foreigners because they were white. 
É difícil saber as suas nacionalidades, mas conhecemos que como a Marola é um hotel que... It's difficult to know which nationalities. Na altura de... But Amarula is a hotel that hosted many foreigners at the time of the attack. Era o melhor lugar, o melhor sítio onde podia ser. Many foreigners thought it was the best place to find protection, so they ran there. É, a segurança realmente existiu, mas é, os insurgentes... They had security, but the insurgents were stronger. Conseguiram arrombar os estabelecimentos. They broke into the hotel and took 12 citizens of different nationalities, tied them up and beheaded them there. The video showed disturbed earth where De Silva said the bodies had been buried, adding that he had conducted the funerals. A national police spokesman said they could not confirm the contents of the footage but were investigating. Militants attacked the town, which is adjacent to gas developments and home to numerous foreign companies, on March the 24th. The government has confirmed dozens of people were killed, and aid workers say tens of thousands have been forced to flee. On Sunday, the military said Palma was now completely safe. A meeting of regional leaders about how to respond to the insurgency was due to conclude on Thursday. Mozambique's president, Felipe Nussi, has come under pressure to accept international help to fight the rapidly escalating violence in the northern Cabo Delgado province. On Wednesday, he said Mozambique would tackle some aspects of the problem alone for reasons of sovereignty. That report by David Doyle of Reuters. One army officer and 10 soldiers were killed in Nigeria's Benue state in what a spokesman said was an unprovoked attack on Thursday. Sources told Reuters media that civilians in fear of soldiers looking to root out the perpetrators were fleeing the Conchisha local government, where one local leader's house had been burnt to the ground. The violence in the restive Middle Belt region marked the latest bout of instability in Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan expressed U.S. concerns over the crisis in the Tigray region in a call with Ethiopia's Deputy Prime Minister Demeke Mekanen. According to the White House, the two discussed critical steps to address the crisis, including expanding humanitarian access, cessation of hostilities, departure of foreign troops, and independent investigations into atrocities and human rights violations. The phone call took place on Wednesday. The White House said Sullivan and McConnell also discussed the importance of continued regional dialogue to resolve disputes related to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, a giant Blue Nile hydroelectric project that has raised concerns in Sudan and Egypt. The African Union has dropped plans to secure COVID-19 vaccines from the Serum Institute of India for African nations. According to the head of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, John Kengasong, the AU is exploring options with Johnson & Johnson. Ikenga Song told reporters on Thursday, the Institute will still supply the AstraZeneca vaccine to Africa through the COVAX vaccine sharing facility. However, the African Union would seek additional supplies from Johnson & Johnson. The statement comes a day after European and British medicine regulators said they had found possible links between AstraZeneca's vaccine and reports of very rare cases of brain blood clots, and they reaffirmed its importance in protecting people. Ikenga Song said the possible link had nothing to do with the African Union's decision. Checking the spread of the coronavirus through the hand washing is a challenge in Kenya, where many people can't afford soap. To help a Kenyan charity is making soap out of vegetables to hand out in the city slums. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi. In the Soweto slum of Nairobi, volunteers are making soap from vegetables. The goal is to provide soap for residents to wash their hands and prevent the spread of COVID-19. About 86% of Kenyans find it hard to access soap and running water each day, according to a UNICEF report last year. That includes most of Soweto's more than 70,000 residents. Right now, the economy is high. The little I get is for feeding the family. Will I buy soap or provide for my children? For people like Peter Maina, Kenyan charities like the Tulinde Child Trust are filling the gap. Free hand wash. 
Free. Moshe Mikono. People in this area, they don't have money to buy soap to wash hands with. As you, you can even see, some of them don't have the water to wash their hands. But as we give out the soap, we are encouraging people to wash their hands using the soap. Yeah, the demand is high, but the supply is low because I can't afford giving out handouts to all of them. Kenya has about 140,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and more than 2,000 deaths. Authorities are passing out the soap at local meetings about the dangers of coronavirus. We are able to reach out to many through churches and the chief's barazas and even on in the marketplaces. Regulations require businesses to maintain hand-washing sites for their customers, but authorities have found the rule hard to enforce. We try to arrest people so that we can scare them to set up hand-washing points, that water number one comes once a week, so you have three to four jerry cans to fill. When you fetch the water, would you set up a hand-washing point or take the water home for shower and drinking? Until vaccines arrive, hand-washing, masks and social distancing are the best hope for residents of places like Soweto to avoid the scourge of COVID-19. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. The CDC says cases of coronavirus clusters are increasing in the U.S. in youth sports and daycare centers, while hospitals are reporting more younger adults are being admitted with severe cases of the disease. Coronavirus variants are to blame for the rise. Mariama Diallo has our report. Speaking at the White House COVID briefing Wednesday, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky says cases are rising among younger people as the country sees the increasing prevalence of coronavirus variants. Across the country, we are hearing reports of clusters of cases associated with daycare centers and youth sports. Hospitals are seeing more and more younger adults, those in their 30s and 40s, admitted with severe disease. Data suggests this is all happening as we are seeing increasing prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 variants, with 52 jurisdictions now reporting cases of variants of concern. The highly contagious B117 variant originated in Britain. It's the most common strain circulating in the U.S. and has been shown to be more transmissible and infectious among younger Americans, she says. In areas of substantial or high community transmission, CDC guidance specifically suggests refraining from new sports that are not outside and cannot be conducted at least six feet apart. Similarly, large events should also be deferred. The Biden administration also said Wednesday the federal government is expanding coronavirus vaccine access to all federally qualified community health centers. White House COVID-19 advisor Andy Slavitt that we are expanding our community health center vaccine program so that the nearly 1,400 community health centers can sign up to receive and, admi and administer doses to their patients. Many community health centers are located in underserved communities and serve patients that are predominantly either uninsured or underinsured. The U.S. leads the world with more than 30.9 million confirmed cases and more than 559,000 confirmed deaths, according to Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. As of Wednesday, Slavitt says the vaccination program is ahead of schedule, with more than 108 million Americans having received at least one dose of the vaccine. Maria Majalu, VOA News, Washington. We would like to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com still to come. A music treat by a multi-talented South African artist. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Africa 54. In part two of my interview with Dr. Haruna Yakub, a psychiatrist and senior registrar at Amino Kano Teaching Hospital, he talks about the various forms of treatment and therapy being offered to victims of abduction and kidnapping to help them cope with the psychological trauma they have undergone. We treat their anxiety with anxiolytics for and based on the uh, uh, National uh, Institute for Clinical Excellence, we treat them with selective serotonin uptake inhibitors. And psychologically, we give cognitive therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. Their social treatment, we teach them how to, 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 to reintegrate into the society, to, to, to understand that they are safe. We, we integrate both the family and the victims together to help them to re-socialize again. Then also, we, 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 we teach them the aspect of positive psychology, aspect of resilience and coping. What are the parents telling you about their children that some may not openly discuss with you? For some that, have, that their children have been rescued, they blame the, 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 the government entirely for the insecurity. Some of them blame themselves for not giving, the, giving their, their, their children adequate security. For some that the children have not been rescued, they, they, they come with, with serious problems about what they experience and the fear of the outcome of their children. Those are the major complaints we, we get from these uh, parents. Does the country have enough social services to provide counselling for these students? I would say we are in a country where the people that will offer these services are not adequate. We are in a country with over 200 million people with a very few number of psychiatrists or people in mental health in general with less than 200 specialists in mental health. So the workload is too much. So it's just like uh, people that are privileged that will have the long-term services. Doctor, what are the long-term effects of these kidnappings for Nigerian students and the community? The long-term effects will include, for older age group, enduring personality change following catastrophic experience. Where somebody will have mistrust for the, for, for the, for the whole of the society, uh, anger for the society, uh, irritability, and, and in fact social withdrawal. And this, even though it's a clinical diagnosis that has to be done after two years of the experience or of the symptoms. Then post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression and anxiety, which can be recurrent. And the question I believe most of them are asking, will they ever recover? Yes. That's a question they always ask. But it's a very uh, difficult question for every clinician. We can only assure them of getting well in the short term. But we have to be honest with them that the condition has a chronic cause with a lot of occurrences, especially those with anxiety disorders and major depression. Dr. Haruna, how has this impacted the health sector in Nigeria? Presently, the Association of Resident Doctors in Nigeria, National Association of Resident Doctors, are even on strike because of a lot of issues with the health sector. So people want to come into the uh, program, people want to stay in the country to help the country, but the government is not doing well. They are not helping them to, to, to solve their immediate problem. So if the government will help with all the demands of these health workers, people will come in and they will be ready to work, and people will be ready to come in to help people with these uh, problems and the country at large. How has that impacted you as a person? Many people live in Nigeria to work elsewhere. I, or, I already made up my mind. I'll go out, improve on what I'm doing, come back to continue. It's really painful. I want the government to please do something, particularly with security, with the health sector. They should please listen to us. Listen to, they should feel the pain 
people are feeling is really painful. I have never, no matter the level of physical pain, you never would see somebody in any form of physical pain wishing to die or to, 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 to commit suicide. But mental pain, emotional pain, is really painful. Please let them know this. They should employ more people into the security agencies. More, the, our military is inadequate. They should be our, 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 our police force, other security, they are grossly inadequate. We encourage them to provide the security. So also, the health sector as well is a mess. They should help us. They should listen to the health personnel so that we have the strength to, to impact on the lives of these people. Dr. Haruna Yakub is a psychiatrist and senior registrar at Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital in Nigeria. Now for a few minutes of good vibes, fresh fashion and smooth vocals, Heather Maxwell selected this music video for us to enjoy. The multi-talented singer from KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, Aubrey Kwana, sings Molo. In it, he waves hello to all of the jealous haters and doesn't pay them any mind.
And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend. We're bringing women's voices to the conversation. And more than that, we're building a community of inclusion and empowerment. Here in Kinshasa, campaigns to raise awareness against the spread of coronavirus are common. But getting that information to people who have no access to water, electricity, or money can be a challenge. We are here at Kalerwe Market, Uganda, Kampala, where in this whole market, women are crying out for their situations to change. For women, it will be better for us. I think a big thing for me is just being able to say that when these protests are happening, uh, does it turn around into policy? Our kids are raped every single day. This movement got the governments to listen. It really was powerful because it showed what is possible when men and women band together and say enough is enough. It's not necessary anymore to climb on a car. I can be in any place to cheer with the people.